let's start it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to welcome all of you, and we're going to, some of you are still joining, um, to our uh, September League of Women Voters annual meeting. We're not annual meeting, monthly meeting. Um, this is the first meeting that we will be having a guest speaker. We're using Zoom, and we will be recording it um on the for on the league's youtube channel so you can go back and look later so be aware of what you, what you say is being recorded for posterity um everyone should mute yourselves and and um you know later we're going to have an opportunity uh for questions and answers if you do have any questions please enter them in the chat box um because uh Karen Kitsy will be monitoring it. And um, after um, Representative Shanklin's presentation, we'll have a chance to address questions. And then if time allows, we'll actually open up, up to the floor. So um, with that, I am going to pass the meeting over to uh, Cheryl Hobbs, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. And I'm especially excited to welcome our speaker today. Representative Katrina Shanklin was originally scheduled to meet with us in June in Manaqua, but COVID did some reorganizing and so she is now our speaker for our first program meeting on Zoom. Representative Shanklin lives in Stevens Point and has been in the State Assembly since 2013. She attended Marquette University and is a graduate of UW Stevens Point with a Master of Science degree in Community and Organizational Leadership. She serves on the Assembly Committees of Colleges and Universities, Workforce Development, the Environment and Sporting Heritage, the Joint Legislative Audit, Audit Committee, and the Governor's Council on Workforce Investment. I may have left some out, I'm not sure. Um, she is the vice chair of the speaker's bipartisan task force on water quality and is speaking to us today on PFAS and water quality in the North Woods. Representative Katrina Shanklin, I turn it over to you. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me, everybody. It's great to see you all. And I'm going to share my screen with you and start off a PowerPoint quick. All right, and here we go. So let's make sure, can everybody see it all right? Are we good to go? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to talk about, I was asked to speak about PFAS. So I'm going to give you kind of a brief crash course in what PFAS are and then the state action that has been taken thus far on PFAS. Um, please note that there are many things that are going on regarding PFAS on the federal level and sometimes on the local level, but as a state legislator, I am providing kind of a 101 uh, information level with regard to PFAS. So PFAS are known as forever chemicals. They, uh, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They're also referred to as per and polyfluorinated compounds. This is a class of many, many different emerging contaminants that have been used since the 1950s by industry and in consumer products. So these are man-made synthetic chemicals, and some of them have been phased out of production in North America. Um, so some are left over and some still are not um, being regulated and are still allowed in production. The fluorinated long chain carbon molecules, so the PFAS that we're going to be talking about are found in non-stick cookware like Teflon, in waterproof jackets, in food packaging, in carpeting. Um, it's pretty widely produced and the two most common um, substances that we're going to talk about today and that if folks who are in policy are talking about are likely PFOA and PFOS. Um, PFAS are known as forever chemicals, and that's because they're persistent. So they're, they're very difficult to break down, and then they bioaccumulate in your body. So that means they stay in your body for a long time. It's similar to mercury and PCBs in terms of um, 
its persistence, we'll say. So that's why this is an issue that's so important to people because it does affect human health in addition to staying in your body for a long time. So here's what we know about PFAS exposure and the health effects. And please know that, um, as I mentioned before, PFAS actually are thousands of different chemicals. The two most popular or two most widely studied and most well-known are PFOS and PFOA. Um, we don't have extensive literature review of every kind of PFAS. So what I'm gonna talk about today are the ones that the State Department of Health Services has studies um, for, and I think they have about 4,000 different peer-reviewed literature um, from around the world. So not all PFAS have the same health effects, and about 98% of people in the United States have some level of PFAS in their blood. So when we talk about high levels of PFAS, we're talking about those who are way above that um, level of exposure that most people have. Uh, it's typically a higher level of exposure because they live in an area that um, has a greater level of exposure. So we'll talk about that too. Um, according to the State Department of Health Services, high levels of some PFAS may have the following health effects on people. So it can affect your cholesterol levels. It can decrease how your body responds to a vaccine in terms of its effectiveness. It can increase the risk of thyroid disease. It can decrease fertility in women, and it can increase the risk of serious conditions like high blood pressure or preeclampsia in pregnant women. It can also potentially lower infant birth weights. Um, so PFAS in Wisconsin, the State Department of Natural Resources and the State Department of Health Services are working together on this. And I'll talk for a little bit about what the governor and his response has been since 2019. What we know so far in terms of PFAS hotspots are the, definitely the most widespread contamination um, from private industry is at the Tyco and Johnson Controls Center, the firefighting foam manufacturing testing site. Um, they have monitoring wells there and the company and the Department of Natural Resources, Department of Health Services are working hand in hand to test um, and monitor the water and work with the residents there. There's also um, airports and military properties throughout Wisconsin. So whether we're looking at Truex Field in Madison, Fort McCoy in Sparta, the Air Reserve Station in Milwaukee, basically anywhere in which there was a significant usage of firefighting foam, AFFF firefighting foam, which has PFAS in it, um, you will see uh, a correlation between you know, that, that usage of firefighting foam and then the PFAS locations or hotspots in Wisconsin. The Department of Natural Resources also has um, a tracking system that you can look at, and I, I went there to just see if there were any new ones, and I, I found 12. Um, that they're working on in terms of remediation um, with the, the folks at whether the Air Reserve Station, Fort McCoy, Truex Field, or Tyco Johnson Control. So those are the ones that most people are aware of at the moment, but we also know at other smaller airports throughout Wisconsin um, and smaller fire departments, that is a possible risk as well due to the firefighting foam. And the Department of Natural Resources is working on that with all of our airports and fire departments across the state. So in 2019, Governor Evers declared the, the year of clean drinking water. And he immediately that February put in his state budget proposal, over $100 million in clean water initiatives. So that executive action was really important because it set the bar for the legislature, not only in terms of you know, declaring the year of clean drinking water, but also investing in um, mechanisms to clean up our water and then further prevent contamination. Unfortunately, by June, uh, the legislature's Joint Finance Committee removed 72 million of those clean water initiatives from the governor's budget, meaning that didn't pass and become law. But I think you know it's important to recognize that some, some of the initiatives were included in um, the task force, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The governor also signed executive order number 40, and that was very important to PFAS in Wisconsin. The first thing it does is it directs the Department of Natural Resources to develop some regulatory standards, meaning ways to protect the public health, and then inform the public regarding, you know, if there's a new PFAS hotspot that's detected the ability to let people know about it. In addition to establishing a website so people can learn more about PFAS, it's an emerging contaminant, meaning 
there's still research, we're still investigating. And there are um, health departments around the world that are looking into long-term health effects and then looking at ways to monitor PFAS and broaden it so that we're not just looking at test sites across the state at fire departments or at military sites or airports, but also um, at other sites. And so having a look at um, waste departments and the leachate in biosolids that are spread on farm fields. So making sure that we're looking at all possible sources of PFAS and then all possible contamination. So that's the other piece of the executive order is it created the PFAS Coordinating Council and that includes um, the formation of a multi PFAS action plan to identify and prioritize the likely known PFAS sources. So that's making sure the Department of Health Services, the Department of Natural Resources, the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, the Department of Transportation, pretty much any state agency that might be affected by this is working together and has a long term plan. Um, and you can watch those PFAS coordinating council meetings if you're interested. You will see that there are municipal waste departments who um, present to the coordinating council. Members of industry are also there um, speaking with the coordinating council. But th those are public meetings that the PFAS coordinating council leads. And the goal is for all of the state agencies to work in close concert with each other to track, by prioritize the cleanup of known PFAS sources. So around the same time that Governor Evers declared 2019 the year of clean drinking water, Speaker Voss, the Speaker of the Assembly, created the Speaker's Task Force on Water Quality. And this is a bipartisan and bicameral task force. So both the Assembly and Senate participated in this. And the goal is to address water quality issues in the state. So I was chosen to serve as vice chair and we started that process in March 2019. At our first meeting, we had our State Department of Natural Resources, the Department of Health Services, and DATCAP um, brief us together by providing not only their water quality recommendations, but a crash course in all of the contamination and water quality issues Wisconsin is facing. And it isn't just PFAS, to be clear, but um, they provided us with budget recommendations and bill recommendations. And they attended all of our public hearings around the state. So um, about a year later, the task force introduced a comprehensive report in January, and we put forward 10 bipartisan bills, which passed unanimously through the assembly in February 2020. Um, and one of the bills, which I'll talk about in a little while, addressed PFAS. While all of those 10 bipartisan bills passed unanimously through the assembly, none of the bills have passed the state Senate yet. The Senate was going to um, meet, I think, on March 24th this year, but due to the pandemic, they still haven't met. There are about 160 bills left on the table that the assembly has passed, um, 10 of which relate to water quality, but many others as well, that the Senate just hasn't taken up. And we're not sure if they're going to come in at all for the rest of the year. Um, and needless to say, that's a disappointment for people like me who worked really hard, but we cannot control the Senate. Um, if you're interested in this, you can definitely call up your state senator and let them know that you'd like to see this move forward, but this is an issue that is really important to the people of the state. So I'm disappointed they did not pass the Senate yet. So we went, you can see a map here of all the places we went across the state. Um, and we tried to be as geographically balanced as possible while listening to the folks from Superior to Marinette to Racine to Menominee. And we held 14 public hearings and we heard from people on many diverse um, contamination issues, whether it's nitrate in their private well or bacteria, um, lead in their pipes, PFAS, or toxic algae blooms in their lakes. These are all issues that um, impact people's ability to access clean drinking water from their taps and their ability to enjoy a beautiful summer's day out on the lake. So we wanted to invite people to testify and anyone who asked to speak was able to. We had 70 organizations speak, over 200 people, um, unaffiliated with organizations who came to testify. We traveled just over 2,300 miles across the state and we participated in tours. So several farm tours, some water department tours and a wetland even. Um, so we tried to get a diverse array of stakeholders to speak at every hearing. 
and we heard many different things, but the commonality was certainly about the need to act. So um, whether we heard from the public, 214 people, uh, invited experts and scientists, we heard from folks with degrees in hydrogeology or microbiology, our state departments not only testified, but our agencies um, were at every single hearing to help us not only collect scientific information, but correct the record if something came up that was inaccurate. We also heard from our county staff and they were first to testify at every hearing. We wanted to draw on local experts. So our land and water conservation departments, you know, in the planning thing are very important to protecting our land and water in every county. We also heard from our public health experts and our goal was to hear from county conservationists and public health together and we felt those presentations were instrumental into understanding not only the lay of the land when we traveled to a different place but also local government's efforts when it comes to identifying tracking and cleaning up contamination and then secondly and, and more importantly the prevention aspect we also heard from a diverse array of farmers and producer-led groups, producer-led watershed groups um, are people who are farming together for a common goal related to reducing you know, phosphorus or nitrate contamination. We heard from a lot of folks um, from the UW system and to work together at Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey or USDA um, to prevent contamination and then track contamination. We also heard from many conservation groups, whether it's the Wetlands Association or Land and Water or Wisconsin Lakes and River Alliance. Um, we wanted to hear from folks about the tourism and sporting heritage aspect of conservation, as well as the public health aspect. And then we also heard from some folks from the private sector. So one of the 10 bills that we recommended to the legislature in which we passed unanimously through the assembly is Assembly Bill 792. And that provides um, an additional quarter of a million dollars for the state's Clean Sweep program. Now, if you're not familiar with Clean Sweep, it's a grant program run by DATCAP. And really what it does is it incentivizes the disposal of uh, any household hazardous waste as well as agricultural pesticides and prescription drugs. So um, I think everyone's familiar with the prescription drug take back day. Um, that's a piece of it. But if you're a farmer, for example, you're probably very familiar with how to get rid of your agricultural pesticides. That's part of the clean sweep program. Wisconsin did not have and still doesn't any um, concerted way in which we're gathering up PFAS found in AFFF fire foam and containing it. And we were very concerned about that. So we wanted to add more funding for those clean sweep program and any grant, or I should say any county, town, village, city, tribe, sanitary or sewage district or regional planning commission would be able to get this grant, this funding through clean sweep to collect the firefighting foams containing PFAS, AFFF, and then to make sure they're either storing it in an environmentally safe way or properly disposing it. Um, what's really important to know here is there are fire departments that might still um, not know what, what their firefighting foam looks like. And the Natural Resources Board is working on a rule relating to that, which I'll mention in a second, but we need to make sure every small fire department in the state, in addition to our towns, villages, cities, airports are all collecting this firefighting foam up. Um, the CLEAR Act is another bill that was introduced to take on PFAS. And it's called the CLEAR Act because it stands for the Chemical Level Enforcement and Remediation Act. And it is one of the more comprehensive bills in the country on PFAS because it really takes a holistic approach. Instead of just banning one thing like firefighting foam, it directs the Department of Natural Resources based on what the Department of Health Services recommends to establish what's considered an acceptable level for PFAS standards. So as I mentioned before, you know about 98% of Americans have some level of PFAS in their blood. What we want to do is identify where it becomes harmful. At what point is it no longer accept acceptable for us to be exposed to PFAS in our drinking water, in the fish we eat, uh, in the solid waste, in the air, in the surface water, groundwater, the soil, and the sediment. 
So what the CLEAR Act would do is it would allow the two state agencies to work together to create um, enforceable health standards. And so if, if someone were to go over that um, by polluting the groundwater with an unacceptable level of PFAS, for example, the DNR could come in and say, you know, that's a violation. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to work together to fix it. Right now, we really don't have that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the state's long-term plan regarding that in a little bit. But it's important to note that this bill has been out there for a little over a year. And the goal is to really make sure we don't just have health standards, but that the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Health Services would be working together to have a long-term plan not only um, addressing the PFAS contamination, but preventing it for the future. So we don't have to worry as much about the public health as there are uh, folks in Marinette and Peshago who are worried right now due to their high levels of exposure. Here's another bill um, that it did not pass. It made it further than the CLEAR Act. And this was considered compromise PFAS legislation and it was bipartisan. So one of the legislators who represents, uh, I should say both actually represent Marinette, Representative Nigren and Senator Hansen, um, introduced these two bills in February 2020 right at the end of session. And the goal was similar to the CLEAR Act, just more um, focused on two uh, PFAS, PFOA and PFOS, and to not just support the state agencies, but create some grant programs. So what the bill would do is allow DNR and DHS to establish PFAS standards. It would just be more curtailed than the CLEAR Act. It would create some grant programs and provide funding for um, blood testing and a cancer cluster study for the people in that region, uh, Marinette and Peshago, who have been exposed to PFAS, and then provide some rulemaking authority to the state agencies. That bill um, went through the Assembly Environment Committee unanimously. I serve on that committee and um, push really hard uh, with Representative Nigren and Senator Hansen to see it through. Uh, I was excited when we passed it unanimously. The Senate passed it through uh, their committee, but it was never scheduled for a vote at the end of session. And on the last session day, I asked multiple times, can we please vote on this? We need to get it done. While it's not nearly as comprehensive as the CLEAR Act, what it does is it allows our state agencies to take action immediately when it comes to PFAS. Um, so I'm really hoping next session we can do something similar to this um, because the Senate and Assembly are not in session right now. It doesn't look likely that this will happen this year. And then here is a bill that has passed and was signed into law. And I mentioned earlier that one of the sources of PFAS is in the use of AFFF firefighting foams. This bill was narrow. Um, and it, what it did is, it is now law, it prohibits the use or discharge of AFFF firefighting foams containing PFAS unless there's an emergency firefighting or fire prevention operation. Um, so currently you could have used it just for testing, um, I should say prior to the bill getting signed into law. And that is just not uh, a reasonable risk given what we know now about PFAS. So it really can only be used for emergency firefighting if you're gonna use it for testing purposes, you have to have the Department of Natural Resources approve your test facility, and you have to show um, that that PFAS, AFFF firefighting foam, cannot get into the wastewater, cannot get into the water people drink. You have to have an appropriate containment, treatment, and disposal measure. measure. And that's kind of the big issue that, that people have been running into is in the past, it was never treated uh, like, I shouldn't say never, but it was maybe not contained in a way that it should have been. And so um, we've seen firefighting foam get into the groundwater, the sediment uh, be applied to land as a biosolid. And all of these can, as we know now, lead to public health issues. So instead of banning it all together, what this bill does is it allows it in just a couple circumstances related to emergencies or limited testing purposes if approved by the DNR. Um, here's where it is now. You heard me earlier kind of mention that there still needs to be some work on this. Even though it was signed into law last year or earlier this year, I should say, the emergency rule regarding it is still going through the Natural Resources Board. And they met last month in August um, and tabled it because the industry expressed some concerns about it. Um, this already passed the Assembly and Senate and was signed into law. So 
I'm a bit concerned about the, the reason why it's not being, um, why it wasn't, the emergency rule wasn't approved last month. I'm hoping when they meet on September 22nd this month that the Natural Resources Board will approve it. But the legislative intent was very clear. We wanted to make sure people weren't just using firefighting foams with PFAS indiscriminately for testing when I want to say that this isn't the only kind of firefighting foam available. Um, the reason why this has been used widely is because of its propensity in terms of effectiveness, but there are other firefighting foams available that do not have high levels of PFAS, and that's what the legislature, what we, when we passed this bill, basically told our fire departments um, and other operations that rely on firefighting foam to do. And the Department of Natural Resources uh, sent a letter to the airports and fire departments across the state. They're working on tracking, you know, who has what, how can we collect it, all of that kind of stuff um, for when it comes to AFFF firefighting foam. And right now that's just um, voluntary as long as they're placing it and keeping it in a place for containment um, and aren't using it for testing or they can only use it in emergency firefighting. I think the goal is long-term, just like our clean sweep bill, we wanna see this um, used infrequently or rarely and only for emergencies. So hoping on September 22nd, we'll get a positive result moving forward. So here is the other piece of PFAS. Um, the state regulates different kinds of health standards and environmental standards for all of our drinking water, our groundwater, and our surface water. So most of you are probably familiar with our nitrate drinking standard. Um, anything above 10 parts per million, or uh, I should say 10 milligrams per liter, is considered a public health concern or public health issue. And if it's a public um, drinking water source, you will see a sign posted if they've gone above that 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate um, because women um, who are pregnant or want to be should not be drinking that water. If you are drinking it long term from that source, for example, you could have you could be more likely to get certain kinds of cancer. And so that's just one example of the way that the state and federal government regulate uh, environmental standards for drinking water. We also do it for groundwater and surface water, um, whether it's mercury or PCBs, you name it. So the DNR started this process uh, in January 2020 when the NRB, the Natural Resources Board, authorized the PFAS rulemaking process to start the rules um, to create state environmental standards for PFOA and PFOS. And the DNR and the Department of Health Services recommended 20 parts per trillion. So their enforcement standard, once you, if you were a company that had uh, some kind of emission of more than 20 parts per trillion, the DNR would come in and say, hey, we, we've got to fix this. We're going to work together on this. How can we make this work? Two parts per trillion is the preventive action limit. That's very small, so it's a pretty aggressive standard. Um, that preventive action limit, what that means is the DNR just kind of sends you a letter and says, hey, uh, you're not going to get fined for that. We just want to let you know that's where you're at, and we're going to work with you on ways to fix it. Let's talk about mitigation plans. So uh, enforcement standard is 20 parts. The preventive action is two, and there are already folks who are asking for um, a different standard than that because other states have either more um, higher limits or, you know, in some cases, industry says they don't want to have a two parts per trillion preventive action limit. Um, so it's important to recognize that this is just the very beginning of the rulemaking process and it takes 30 months total. And, and the DNR is working on these rules for not only drinking water, but groundwater and surface water. Um, this is a pretty aggressive standard and there are, I think 35 or so, um, about three dozen steps to the rulemaking process. And, and all that means is the agencies are basically getting the rule ready to go through those 30 months and different steps that they have to take to notify the public, to take public comment, to listen to concerns, work with stakeholders, and then ultimately publish the rule, which everyone has to abide by. And when that rule is published, that will then give the DNR uh, the authority to come in if they are above that enforcement standard to enforce the rule. 
So that's one way in which our water could be protected down the road within the next two years. There were previously no real federal standards for PFAS, and there isn't cur currently any enforceable federal standard, but there is work finally being started. So the Environmental Protection Agency set a lifetime drinking water health advisory level, um, and that was a total combined concentration of 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. You can see the difference, 20 parts versus 70 parts. Um, and it's not enforceable. So that advisory level really didn't mean much in terms of action. And so we saw different states setting their own standards. So Michigan, for example, is another one that started working their P PFAS rules. And these are typically much lower than the EPA's advisory level. As I mentioned, Wisconsin's PFOA and PFOS is 20 um, combined. So this year, EPA finally announced that they're putting forward a proposed rulemaking um, all right, they did a notice for proposed rulemaking so that they can start that process. And they're going to set maximum contaminant levels using the Safe Drinking Water Act. So it'll probably be a combined maximum contaminant level for PFOA and PFOS. Um, but it doesn't include other PFA, PFAS, I should say. Um, as I mentioned before, there are thousands of them, you know, for different, um, earlier, I'll go back to this. The drinking water, groundwater, and surface water. I mentioned the PFOA and PFOS uh, that Wisconsin's doing for one of them, but they're looking at other uh, PFAS contaminants in the state as well, and they're expected to put forward some of those this fall. So I just don't have that information yet because the DNR hasn't announced. So the difference between the federal and state government is the state is being more comprehensive. Um, and whereas the EPA is just going for PFOA and PFOS. And because it's a federal rule, that can take years to complete. So just know, um, people ask me, well, why can't it go faster? Uh, on the state level, we have an emergency rulemaking process that cuts down the time for 30, down from 30 months down, but it doesn't have the same level of length or I should say it expires sooner and only the legislature can allow it to continue based on some new rules. So rulemaking is basically the agency's way of um, involving the public in the way that they manage the public health and, and the environment when it comes to these standards. But it does take a long time because it's the state law on the state level for that they have to follow. They can't just make a rule and call it a day. It takes 30 months on purpose and that's written into state law. In the same way that the federal government has to follow the federal laws when it comes to rulemaking. So hopefully that clears that up. Okay, so we are at questions and I think there have been a few in the chat box. So I'm not sure how we're gonna take those. Um, Post yes, questions. I'm I'm Karen Kitsy and I'm handling the questions. So the first question is from Lori Glowak, and the question is, uh, who manufactures firefighting foam? So basically, um, I don't know. I don't know if you're asking for a company, but it's you know this PFAS is a man-made synthetic chemical, and the firefighting foam that is most known to have. Uh, PFAS is AFFF firefighting foam. You, it's very important to recognize not 100% of firefighting foam has PFAS. And um, I think different chemical companies would probably manufacture it, uh, but it's an AFFF foam that is known to have it for fire suppression. So I don't, I don't know which company manufactures it. Uh, the second question is from Dorothy Sky. What is known about the effect of PFAS on plants and wildlife? I don't know how much information is out there yet. I know there are questions about what would happen if folks eat fish that have been um, in rivers or lakes that you know have been contaminated by PFAS. And it is one of the greater questions I think people have right now. I, if you go on the DNR's website, they'll actually say the same thing. They're still looking into it uh, because this is known as an emerging contaminant. We don't have decades of data on the, the human health effects or the wildlife health effects. Unfortunately, we just know based on looking at past kind of similar concerns like PCBs and mercury that we should be concerned and that we should be asking those questions. Um, another question from Dorothy Skye, how is PFAS cleaned up? 
That's a great question and one that we don't have the best answer to yet. So one of the things the legislature has been talking about is what is the best role for us when it comes to containment? So when we debated our clean sweep bill, we knew, first of all, that wasn't enough money to completely contain 100% of PFAS because we're still looking at where it's in the state. The DNR is still working on identifying and tracking and prioritizing it. And in, in instances where it's no longer needed or they have a better um, fighting foam source where they aren't going to keep it on hand or contain it, then we should talk about how to destroy it, right? And that's the question that we don't have the answer to yet. We, um, as legislators who are concerned about PFAS, talked about are there ways to destroy it that are safe or will that harm the environment? Can we ask the UW system uh, to research the best ways? And that's something we're in ongoing talks about because there is not enough information about how best to um, completely contain this. And right now we're, um, it's mainly store, safe storage and rules regarding the use of it and then looking for better alternatives. And there are companies that have moved from long chain to short chain um, PFAS because of the research available too. So this is a, I guess we'll just put it this way, it's an ever evolving situation. I'm not a PFAS expert by any means. I just know kind of what the legislature has talked about. And this is one of those concerns that we're going to continue to have um, questions about and, and want to know more about how best to clean it up. So that's something to be determined. And I think we're hoping the UW system will help us find the right answer there. Thank you. And one more question from Dorothy. Uh, do you happen to know if PFAS are concentrated in particular organs or types of tissues? I do not know that answer. I, I still think um, because PFAS is present in our blood and 98% of Americans have some level of PFAS um, and because it bioaccumulates, so it stays in our body persistently over time and is difficult to break down in the environment, I think that makes it harder for us to fully know. Um, there are, if you're interested in looking more about the, the human health effects, you can go on the State Department of Health Services website and read a little bit more. And they have links to a lot of really good um, peer reviewed scientific literature about this as well. My best advice is unless you've been living on, you know, a, a military base that's known to have PFAS contamination or you're in one of those sites near, you know, Marinette or Peshigo, the Tycho site, um, I wouldn't get a blood test or, you know, freak out about it too much because it's one of those situations where we're still learning. Uh, and it took, I'll, I'll just compare this to nitrate. Um, it took until I think last year for us to fully understand how many people could potentially be affected by nitrate, um, who I should say nitrate contamination who then got cancer. And even then it's an estimate of about 11,000 people per year. We knew for decades that nitrate had serious health implications, but the research takes a long time because it's difficult to isolate. Um, so I guess my best advice is, you know, look for good scientific sources with peer reviewed literature and um, recognize that we do not have all the answers yet. And we're, you know, the research on PFAS, there are thousands of different um, PFAS and the ones that we know most about PFOA and PFOS are the ones that we know are the most harmful to human health. Um, and Walt Hobbs would like to know, how were these first discovered? Well, um, I don't know the full history, but I do know the chemical company that um, kind of, I don't know if they were the first one, but it's called DuPont. And um, there's a whole movie about it. So I would suggest if you want to learn more about her chemicals and how DuPont made billions of dollars um, basically manufacturing PFAS. There's a movie called Exposed and um, that's, or I'm sorry, I think the book's called Exposed and the movie's called Dark Waters and Mark Ruffalo's in it. And there's a group who um, is very active on this issue that Mark Ruffalo has been working on. They're a group of veterans. Um, and I think they have some active service members as well who are very concerned about the use of forever chemicals, PFAS, in our firefighting foam um, that have essentially disproportionately affected people who live on, on or near bases. So I do think, you know, there's a big story to, to learn about if you're interested in, in reading more. It's called Exposed. Um, and then the, the movie's based on the book. And that, that movie's called Dark Waters. Thank you. Um, do you know how we would access that film? 
Um, I, I assume at this point you can probably rent it because it was in theaters last year. All right, uh, another question from Dorothy. Uh, do PFAS set or does PFAS settle out in lakes or streams or do they remain suspended? Uh, I do not know the answer to that. It is, okay. so the, it isn't like a, so this is a chemical, so it isn't like you wouldn't, I don't know that you'd be able to see it, but um, I would just go on the Department of Natural Resources website and read more about it if you have more questions. Um, I think the issue that we have right now is in places where there is high, there are high levels of contamination, we're basically tracking the, the water um, PFAS levels through wells and well monitoring. Um, and that's the, the big form of, or mechanism, I should say, for oversight in places like Ty uh, Peshigo and Marinette where Tycho Johnson controls is. Um, Kathleen Conley Barth, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Do we have any idea of the quantities of PFAS that are in the environment? and how that compares to PCBs. I do not know how it compares to PCBs, but the whole point of the regulatory framework I mentioned with um, setting enforcement mechanisms and levels, acceptable levels, is for the DNR to have the authority to not only monitor our drinking water, but also our service water and then our groundwater. And if they are above a certain level, the level that they think is acceptable based on the public health, then they would no longer allow, be allowed to be. And we would have the uh, enforcement action, the DNR would, to go in and say, this is you know, not acceptable. We're going to order it to be cleaned up. We need a remediation plan. Um, and then they'd have like a, a liability requirement under the state's um, law regarding that. So right now we don't have a regulatory framework in place to say exactly where things are at and how we'd move forward. And that's why the state and federal government's action on enforcement limits and advisory limits are both really important. And you know, in the next few years, we'll have a better understanding of where we go from here. Uh, Lori Glowak would like to know, do you recommend having our wells tested for PFAS? Um, I don't know that there are only a few labs in the state that even do that actually. Uh, I think there are eight total and it, you really should not spend your money getting a test for something if um, you're not going through a certified lab where the lab is certified by the federal government for PFAS testing. So that I would check that first. Um, if you are concerned, uh, it, first of all, if you have a private well, then yeah, there's no, there's, um, no kind of governance or oversight of private wells when it comes to this. So that's important to know. Um, but I also think unless you live near a location in which there's a known contamination, um, I don't know how valuable it would be. And I'm not an expert in this. Um, certainly in Peshigo and Marinette, we have, you know, there's well testing all over uh, because of concern and folks are not drinking from wells at all. They're, they're, um, utilizing another water supply source. Uh, in Madison, um, that is in, the, the, actually one of the wells in Madison tested above um, a certain, I don't think it was above a certain standard, but it was a, a level high enough to, you know, create some headlines and have residents ask questions. So if you have a public utility, um, you get your annual report each year. Uh, the public utilities, as far as I know, are not unless voluntarily they're not required to test for PFAS right now. And that's, again, what the DNR is working on, that rule eventually will be there and we'll know. Um, I would suggest if you're really interested in pursuing this, Midwest Environmental Advocates has some good information on PFAS and they list, I think there are eight certified labs in the state, but go through there. Do not just find some random company because they have to be certified in order to the test. Um, and again, that's, that's an issue that we've been hearing about in terms of testing as well. So every once in a while, I hear a story about someone who's trying to sell something, selling tests to people and then selling filters. And again, I would go through someone certified. So I want to make sure people recognize that. I also don't want to instill fear 
I, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the DNR are doing everything they can right now within the parameters that I laid out to not only track where things are at, but also have a long-term and short-term plan for remediation and prevention. So just know that within the next two years, we'll have a lot more information about this and the state will be acting to prevent um, the kind of contamination that we saw at Pashko and Marinat. Um, so it was Midwest Environmental Advocates. Advocates. Okay. Okay. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat, so I'm going to hand this back over to Jane Trotter and let her explain hand raising. Okay. So we do have a little bit of time. Um, there's two ways you can actually raise your hand by just raising your hand if you have a question or a comment that you want to make. Um, and just a reminder, if we're making comments and not asking questions, this is a nonpartisan group. So uh, we need to keep that in mind when we make our comments. Um, there is also a, a way, and it uh, depends on which platform you're using Zoom, where you can actually raise your hand. Um, so, um, and I will do that just so that you can see, oh, yeah, maybe not, <laughs> um, where you can actually raise your hand. And then, there we go. Um, can you see that? So, um, you could do that if you wanted. Um, and I will call on you. Um, I'm not sure if that works if you've got your video turned off. So, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, all right, anybody have anything that they want to uh, add? Uh, this is Tom Giroux. I, do, I can't find the raise the hand thing, but if okay. I could a question. You know, here in Rhinelander, our water supply, our municipal water supply is contaminated with PFAS. They've turned off two wells and we currently meet health standards, but um, if one of our two remaining wells go down, we'll have inadequate water supply and we'll have to turn on the contaminated water again. And, you know, we know about it. And it seems to me one of the things we should be doing is testing all municipal water. And we should have a testing program for private wells as well. Um, and the other thing given what we know about the health effects, I wish there was a way to streamline the three-year process to get a rule in place. It seems like we know enough about the health impacts. Uh, and so I'd appreciate uh, Katrina's uh, comments on this. I think she's a hero on water issues. I attended almost every of the speaker task force hearings except for one or two, uh, several in person, most I've watched the videos. So uh, kudos to her, she did a great job and is a great advocate for clean water. Thanks, um, I'll mention, so the eight, AB 842, that bipartisan compromise bill would have allowed the agencies to use emergency rules, fast tracking the process as opposed to, you know, the current 30 month rulemaking process. And that's why it was so disappointing that we were able to, you know, get that bill unanimously through the Assembly Environment Committee, and then it just never got scheduled for a floor vote. And instead, they introduced an amendment to an unrelated lake bill uh, that really was not helpful. And that was shocking to me. Um, so it's, it's frustrating, I agree with you. I, the, the state agencies though can't just not follow the law, they're required by law to follow it. And it's really the legislators who can change the law. And we not only had the power to, we almost did. We almost made it. Um, that bipartisan compromise bill wasn't as great as the CLEAR Act, but it came, you know, it, it came close to giving the agencies the authority they needed to not only test, um, I just looked up, I Google, um, where the DNR sampling and they do have sample, I failed to mention they have sampling sites all over um, the state and they're taking an active interest in, in where these situations are, are headed. And uh, it's a great point to mention Rhinelander. I, I know we had multiple people bring this up to us at several hearings as well. And you're absolutely right that we need to do more when it comes to um, our municipal utilities. 
and I know they have um, weighed in on this issue as well and were part of the conversation regarding that compromise bill that almost passed. So my suggestion would be, you know, if the legislature doesn't come back into session this year in January, what we really need to do is at, at a minimum pass that bipartisan compromise. Chris Adams, what do you have something you'd like to add? Well, I was just um, thankful that Stephen raised the Rhinelander issue because um, my my well and I are located north of the Rhinelander Airport, and those two wells that have been mentioned. And while I've seen some um, engineering studies that indicate that the groundwater flow is like from me south rather than from the contaminated areas north, um, it's still close enough that I've been concerned about this and wondering what I as a homeowner um, can do about this um, or should do about this, if anything. Sure. So I think, first of all, talking to your city officials, um, it looks like they've been testing monthly and they have been testing all the city wells, including the ones that were you know, shut down for public health. Um, DNR also said they had no, it looks like the DNR has been working with them. Um, and they said, you know, they have no reason to question the validity of the testing. The well seven, um, the now low PFA on well seven was probably due to the well being active. So they're looking at and, and monitoring what's going on there as well. Um, but I would also point out, you know, there, if, if it's below the acceptable level where, you know, the DNR would come in if the law were there, then it's just, I shouldn't say just, but it's, you know, an analogy would be, you know, if I'm drinking uh, nitrate that's at, you know, five milligrams per liter, that's under the health standard as well. And it's kind of up to you what, what you want to do next. But if you feel like that's unacceptable and you still don't feel comfortable, you can look at alternative drinking water sources or you can speak to your city um, leaders and, and ask them about how involved they are in this process. And then see, you know, I, I do think is either administrator or mayor might have written to the task force, I'd have to look back, um, asking for assistance and saying, we need monitoring, we need um, testing, and we need a long-term water supply for, for our future. And so, you know, what we really need is a strong partnership between all levels of government on this issue. And so I'd encourage you to speak with your local leaders and see what they're up to and what suggestions they have as well. But it does look like, um, from my end, the DNR has been working with uh, Rhinelander to make sure that their water supply is drinkable, but um, the person who pointed out that in the future that could change, that's also a possibility. So this is an issue that we need all hands on deck for. I'm sorry I don't have all the immediate solutions, but I am heartened to know that, you know, the DNR is taking it seriously and working with them. Thank, thank you very much, Katrina. Um, just to clarify, I live in the town of Newbold and okay. that's within the, the city limits. And okay. so um, even though I'm in proximity to the airport. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So then, yeah, and if you have a private well, then that's that's when I would go onto the Midwest Environmental Advocates website and take a look at if you want to get, you know, a sample to one of the labs that is certified in PFAS testing, just so you have peace of mind, that is something that you could do. Um, Lori Glowak, did you have a question? I was uh, actually looking up something I uh, spent every summer on White Lake in Michigan, and that lake was very badly contaminated by Hooker and DuPont. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of people got very strange cancers. And my father's generation, pretty much everybody died of a cancer. And I was looking up to see what that was, so I, I apologize, <laughs> got distracted here, but this has been really helpful. Thank you for, for your attention and your work. Yeah, and you know, I failed to mention also in, in both Minnesota and Michigan, there have been large settlements that the attorney generals have brought in Minnesota against um, 3M, and they took that money and used it for 
all of the things that I would love to see our state do when it comes to environmental health and protections. Um, so in Michigan, they also had a suit and got a large settlement as well. So I, I that wasn't 3M though. So I, you know, in our state, we don't have like a massive chemical company like DuPont or 3M, but what we do have is um, there are a lot of biosolids being applied through, um, wastewater departments and things like that and so one of the questions that people have is how do we track exactly where the PFAS are and where do we go from here and so I think the DNR is taking the appropriate I think they're taking it seriously and they have an appropriate response so far but what we need in the future is action from the legislature. Dorothy I see you have your hand raised. Yeah a yeah, couple of questions uh, Katrina the, Thank you so much for becoming an expert in this and pursuing it. And I wanted to know what motivated you to take this on and keep at it? That's question number one. And question number two is how can we as individuals or the, the League of Women Voters of the Northwoods most effectively help you act upon this issue? Great question. So I just looked up Michigan. It is actually both 3M and DuPont in Michigan. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, I think this is a topic that's difficult because it requires a baseline understanding. And in water quality in general, I, people have to do a lot of research before they can become fluent in the topic. And so what motivates me is as a legislator who cares not only about the public health, but our environment and natural resources, I know that not everyone wants to put in work, we'll just be honest. And I love it and really, um, I never take my environment for granted, we'll put it that way. I care a lot about how we leave our world to the next generation and the generations after, but I also recognize that for too long, we've been taking the intersection and connection between public health and our environment for granted, right? I didn't know when I was very young that Asthma doesn't just naturally occur in some people and they can develop asthma because of their environment. I wish that was taught more, that there's a connection between the environment you live in and, and your ensuing and responding health, right? And I think it's something that adults take for granted very frequently. And we just assume if someone gets cancer, well, you know, it happens. Well, but, but how? How does it happen? And did they have adverse exposure to something? And so that's that ability to see those connections is really important for a lawmaker to have. And so my best advice um, to answer your second question is I think people need to demand that their lawmakers work hard and not just go to Madison and take votes and, you know, have a floor speech and go home, but spend their time becoming experts on topics that are relevant to their communities. And I represent an area that cares a lot about sustainability. In Stevens Point, we have um, statewide leaders here in forestry and renewable energy and food systems and water quality and water quantity. And so I take my job seriously and try to be as much as, as informed as possible. We need our legislators to do that work and we need them to be advocates um, and not just taking a vote in Madison and calling it a day. So the best thing that you can do is in frequent communication with your lawmakers. Um, sometimes people will tell me, you know, I want to email you, but I know you're busy or I wanted to have a conversation with you, but I didn't want to take up your time, but I work for that and that's my job. So never be apologetic about communicating with and asking for things from your lawmakers, they represent you. So whether it's inviting them to meetings, asking them to introduce legislation, asking them to be strong advocates, co-sponsoring bills, not just voting for bills, that's really important stuff. And so I'd say don't take your relationship between your you and your lawmakers for granted. You have much more power than you think. Um, just don't be afraid to use it. All right, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, um, Katrina Shanklin, Representative Shanklin. We really appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who's attended today. And thank you for your really good questions and your interests. Um, I will remind you again that you can find the video of this later if you weren't busily taking notes. Oh, Kathleen, I see a question. Go ahead. Just saying thank you. The thumbs up. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Um, so you can find this uh, video by just simply Googling LWVNOW and YouTube and um, you'll get to a place. I know because I tested it. Give it a few minutes though <laughs> before we get it up there. Um, our next meeting will be on October 13th and that at noon and at that meeting, the topic will be um, absentee uh, voting, the risks and benefits, and our guest speaker will be Karen McKim from the Wisconsin Electorate Int Integrity um, Group. And they do a lot of research on how safe electronic balloting is, for instance. So um, that will be our, and you will be getting invitations to join. So um, I think with that, we can um, say thank you. And again, thanks for everybody for being here and thanks for everything that all of you do. Take care. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks. Sarah? Yes. Will you stay on for just a second? I would be happy to. Um, you do the press releases, right? <laughs>